downhearted, broken inside, praying for mercy with nowhere to hide. There was a Savior searching for me, grace overflowing, set my soul free.
want to welcome each one this morning to Temple Baptist Church on this July 4th weekend. I'm so grateful uh, that you're here today and uh, realize we have many folks traveling. Vacation season is here, and but I'm grateful to see you this morning, and I trust that you've had a great morning already, and I'm just excited to see your uh, face, it's just to be uh, with God's people, and there's just nothing that can replace that, and I appreciate the presence of the Lord, the sweet spirit of this church and ministry, and I'm uh, looking forward to a wonderful day. If you're glad to be here, would you say amen this morning? We want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him for His blessings this morning. And we have many things to pray about, and I'll try to get mention some of those during the offertory time. Um, but I do want to open up with prayer and also a thought uh, of uh, pertaining to July 4th. Uh, you know, it's, I'm proud to be an American. Amen. I really am. Amen. And uh, I realize we live in a society that uh, doesn't necessarily, as a whole, doesn't necessarily value that as I believe. Personally, we should. But I'm grateful that uh, my heritage, I'm thankful for uh, being here. My father-in-law did a family tree of, uh, of the Harrison family, uh, my wife's maiden name. And, uh, and while he was doing that, he said, he said, Josh, he said, let me get your name in here. So he put the Bowles family. He traced us all the way back to the 1700s in Germington. And, uh, and that's as far as he got, you know, some of those things you, you got to, uh, maneuver through and so you got to wait on other people to add information and so forth and but I'm thankful for my heritage I don't know where I'm from exactly somewhere but uh, but I'm grateful for our country and America I was studying and we'll have a thought this morning Lord willing on the uh, country and our nation but I wanted to read this to you I think it's very important some of you could perhaps even quote this but it's the Mayflower Compact and it's the Mayflower Compact, if you're not familiar with it, was the first governing document for the pilgrims in 1620. So we're talking about long before 1776, uh, when our country was established there 247 years ago. Uh, and, and really, was it called the United States of America? Of course, at that time, the pilgrims were just coming over the, Mayf the Mayflower, and they said, we're going to write down a document that's going to help us give us kind of a, a guideline for our order and I want you to notice some of the phrases in this. I'm going to read this to you. It's fairly short, but I want to read this to you. I want you to listen very carefully. It starts with this. This is the first document, uh, really, for our, in 1620, for our, what later would become America. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are written, underwritten, and, of course, there's many names there that signed that. The loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender and of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement of the Christian faith, an honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these present uh, sol solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices, offices from time to time as shall be brought, thought most met and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. But I want to refer to those mentions again of God. It says, in the name of God, amen, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, for the advancement of the Christian faith and the presence of God. I just think that's really neat and uh, how that, and that just stems down uh, from there. Um, and, and we see, you know, if you pull out a dollar bill, I don't know if any of you carry cash, but perhaps some of you still have a coin or a, a dollar or something. And it still says, in God we trust. And it's just amazing to me uh, how that we still have a lot of uh, Christian faith uh, in implemented into our society. We need to recognize that and be thankful for that. And I meant, I, I'll, I'll stop talking with this but, and pray, but I remember several years ago I was in northern part of Virginia where we lived at the time, and I was getting my oil changed in my car. I sat down beside an older gentleman, and he was very kind, and we were striking up a conversation. And... And, um, and I, it perhaps was summertime, perhaps around this time of July 4th. And uh, he said, you know, he said, young man, he said, you know, we have all these signs and stickers and, 
and everything and that says God bless America. But he said, young man, he said, God has blessed America, and it's time for us to bless him. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning from the book of Proverbs. But uh, raise your hand if you're proud to be an American and you're proud of our godly Christian heritage of our country. You can't get away from that. You may want to ignore it, but you can't get away from the facts. And so I'm grateful for our heritage. And let's pray to the Lord this morning and ask God for his blessings and his help and uh, in his strength and his power in the service this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for allowing us to be back in church this morning. Thank you, Father, for our church family. I love these people so very much. And Father, I'm grateful for this place. I'm thankful for your blessings upon it. I'm thankful for the spirit, the work ethic, the ministry. So much, uh, Father, happens in this place and through it. And we give you all the glory and the praise and honor thanksgiving for that. And Father, I thank you for our country. I thank you for the founding of our country, and uh, I thank you, Father, for our forefathers who they may have not, may or may have not believed exactly like we would, but they believed in the Creator. They believed in you. They believed that uh, we are to reverence you and honor you. And Father, help us to embrace a little bit of that. Be proud of that. Be thankful for that Christian heritage. Thank you for what you've done for us as a country. We thank you for that. We thank you for our freedom. We thank you for all the people that have given their lives so we could be here today in freedom and serving you and worshiping you. Father, I pray that you are blessed today. May the day be about you. And Father, I pray that you would help us in our hearts to uh, humble ourselves before you seek your face. If there's someone here that's not saved, may they trust Christ as their Savior. And Father, help those of us who are saved to grow in our Christian faith. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Choir's going to sing for us once again. You listen, and I know God will use them to be a blessing this morning.
Pastor, I believe in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when it talks about the rapture of the church. It can happen any moment. We look forward to that day. Let's all stand together once again, all of the building. I want you to sing out with all of your heart unto the Lord as we worship together. He is wonderful. Amen. Let's let him know that this morning. this morning, and I want to encourage you, as I always have been the last few weeks, this summertime, let's be faithful in our giving, and uh, again, the air condition uh, needs to be paid for, Duke Power, all of that, you know, and so let's be faithful in our giving, whether it's online or whether it's in the plate this morning. If you're here visiting with us for the very first time, and if you have received a visitor packet, we'd love 
for you to fill out the visitor's card in there and place that in the offering plate when it comes by, or you can hand it to our song leader, or youth pastor, Brother Holly, or myself as you leave today. But I want to encourage you to fill that out. We'd love to have record of you being with us here this morning. I do want to give you several prayer requests as our ushers come forward uh, to pray over the offering. Uh, do pray for Derek and Josephine, their new babies. I was able to visit with them yesterday in their home. And uh, precious little babies. I didn't even, they had them, I walked in, and Derek's here today, so I want to encourage you to congratulate him. Um, I walked in yesterday to their home, and you know, they've got, the, the kids are there, and, and, and uh, Derek and Josephine, they're on the couch. And they had their, the, the two twins right there, boy and girl, right there in front of Miss Josephine. And I just, I, I never heard them. I never, they didn't cry or nothing. Normally, you know, you got newborns, especially two, and, um, and, you know, the other siblings, you know, run around playing, you know, they're going to be crying or something. And I, I spent, I don't know, five minutes with them, and I didn't even see them they're right there in front of me. And I was just thinking they're in the back room asleep or something. But they are precious little babies. We're so grateful for them. So pray for them. We'll be, Lord willing, be doing a, a, driper, a diaper drop-off and, and some gift cards perhaps for them here very soon. So uh, pray for them. And then uh, Joe Dallas, uh, he's how old? Is he three weeks now? two weeks old, and so we're grateful for them. Pray for these ladies as they're recovering and many others who are, are expecting, so let's pray for them as well. Charles Petit, I got to visit with him this week in home and um, very weak, and uh, do pray for him, if you will, please, with his cancer situation. And then also Ms. Dot Adams, it's good to see her this morning. Continue to pray for her, please, if you would, with her cancer situation. Uh, Sarah Bellamy uh, has some physical needs and uh, is going through some tests right now. I want you to pray for her. And then also um, Amber Oates. Uh, good to see Miss Amber today. And she just had surgery on her, uh, on her arm this week. And I was able to go by and have prayer with her. So pray for her if she recovers with that. And then also Tootie uh, Farrington having some tests. Could you pray for him if you will, please. And then Miss Betty Hale. Uh, this is Angela Sheik's mother. And uh, she had hip surgery yesterday. I was able to go by the hospital and have prayer with them. And uh, we miss Jeff and Angela and their family. Do pray for them if you will, please. Uh, with Miss Betty, uh, uh, with with that, all right, and then pray for our, our children's ministry, the Junior Church, Children's Church, and Wiggle Worms, and all of them, and the educational building today, that God would bless them as well. Let's pray and ask God for His blessings. Houston, you come up here, pray for us, uh, new dad, brand new dad, and uh, so I'm proud of you, buddy, and uh, I'm happy for you. You pray for us, and then you can be seated. Let's pray. Dear Grace and Father, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for what you've done. We just want to tell you we love you. We want to thank you for the freedom to be able to come and worship you and and read our be able to read our Bibles on the daily and not have to worry if somebody's watching us. And dear Lord, just touch this offering. Use it for your honor and your glory. Bless the giver and one that just gives, Lord. And may we give back what you've given to us. And dear Lord, we just want to touch all these prayer requests and just pray over them. And dear Lord, you know the need. We just want to ask you to touch it and, and bless that need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Instrumentalists, I appreciate that. Take your Bibles, please. Turn with us to Proverbs chapter number 14. Proverbs chapter 14, uh, the Old Testament. And I see on the screen there Proverbs chapter 13, but it's Proverbs chapter 14 in your Bible this morning. And we're going to be looking at verse number 34. Proverbs chapter 14. 
Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 34. Just one verse this morning, going to be reading, and then we'll introduce this thought and then have another song, and uh, and then we'll get right into the message, Lord willing. I want to give you a couple of thoughts uh, or announcements, really. Uh, I don't like doing announcements necessarily now, but I want to mention as you're turning. uh, Ladies Missionary Prayer Fellowship is having their summer craft and bake sale today in the activity center after this morning service only and so sometimes they do this uh christmas and different times of the year and it's always sunday morning and sunday night but it's just morning service only so get by there there's some good stuff over there and uh, i was cheating a little bit last night eating some cookies my wife was doing they're good and so uh brownies i saw over there and other things and so get by there if you want and to contribute to uh, that uh, ladies ministry of our church then also tonight is our sizzling summer sunday night and i feel a little spiritual every time i say that i love and i'm joking of course but i love these events of our church and uh, they're so fun and so i want to encourage you to be here tonight you say pastor you may not understand something this is july 4th weekend and uh, i'd realize that but i also realize it's the lord's day and uh, can i get an amen right there and uh, we want to put God first. Let's be in our place Sunday night, tonight, and at 6 o'clock for the service. And uh, then right after the service, it'll be about regular time. It will be dismissed, Lord willing, about 7.15 or so. And we'll go right out into the courtyard, this area between the buildings here. And uh, Lord willing, we're going to be outside. And hopefully around 7.15, it won't be so quite as hot. But I want us to be outside. We'll, Lord willing, go over to the activity center where the food is. And then we'll come right back outside. I want to encourage you. Uh, be outside with everyone. Bring your folding chairs. If you don't have a folding chair, you can use a, uh, one of the chairs, uh, white uh, lifetime chairs there in the activity center. But come enjoy that. We've got some glass pop, glass bottle pop. And uh, I thought I'd get at least two or three amens on that one. I, oh, no. But anyway, uh, we've got some glass bottle pop. We've got fireworks. And uh, after the service, they're not, you know, they're not showstoppers or nothing like that. But you'll enjoy them for the kids specifically. And uh, we have hot dogs. And these are 100% beef hot dogs. And then also, not only that, but for uh, the healthy folks, in here today Uh, we'll have all kinds of salads we have fruit salad and broccoli salad all kinds of stuff coming and uh, so we're excited about all the event to have desserts we have uh, ice cream afterwards as well and then we also have giveaways we do this each time we've done this we're so excited we appreciate jeff and nancy cox overseeing this and we're looking forward to a wonderful wonderful time of fellowship it's free charge you can eat four or five hot dogs if you want it's no charge okay now if you get 10 15 we might think about that okay but uh, we're going to have a great time with that if you've never come to sunday night service tonight's the night to start and i want to encourage you to be a part of that tonight and then also five o'clock tonight is a mandatory music ministry meeting with Brother Holly. And so keep that in mind, uh, instrumentalist uh, and a choir. And if you're involved in any way, the special music program uh, meeting tonight, 5 o'clock, please be there for that. Then I'm looking forward in about two weeks or so, uh, two or three weeks, uh, going to the Dash Ball Game as a churchwide event. And uh, if you signed up several weeks ago, I want to encourage you to get by that payment of $8 per person to Miss Holly and uh, soon and so keep that in mind if you will do we have any tickets left miss holly five tickets left okay so uh, if you want to go but didn't get a chance to sign up see miss christy holly and uh, she can help you with that okay proverbs chapter 30 <laughs> proverbs chapter 14 i'm going to mess you really up okay proverbs chapter number 14 and verse number 34 if you found your place would you say amen this morning verse number 34 the bible says righteousness exalteth a nation righteousness exalteth a nation but sin is a reproach to any people we're going to pray and then we get right into this thought of the exaltation of a nation this morning father we love you thank you for your word i pray that you would use it to work in our hearts and i pray that you would help us through this we love you in jesus name amen I just want to take a minute and say something real quick. I know there's a lot of people who have been struggling. I see a lot of prayer requests during the week in our app at, for the church, and I have been struggling. And God has reminded me in Luke 12 that we are not to consider our life 
but to consider the sparrow, consider the lilies, and to know that it is his Father's pleasure to give us all these things that we need. So take consideration in who our God is. appreciate that good Bible truth and I'm thankful that we do have a Heavenly Father who does care and uh, we just need to consider that this morning. I appreciate that, uh, Miss Trish. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 34, again, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now the book of Proverbs was written by one of the kings of Israel by the name of Solomon. And not only was Solomon given an incredible amount of wisdom from God, but he was inspired of God, of course, to pin down these words concerning a nation. Now, Solomon would have a lot of experience uh, in this area of ruling a nation because he was the king, of course, of Israel, as we just mentioned. Not only that, but Israel at that time was a world power. 
And God, the God-fearing American today, which I believe this room is full of, the God-fearing American today can see, really, verse number 34, um, in a reality in our society today. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach up to any people. And although sin has and is bringing a reproach upon America, let me repeat that again. I believe that sin has and is bringing a reproach upon our great country, uh, as the verse tells us. And uh, however, uh, we have hope in righteousness. Brother Matt, am I good on this thing? It's going in and out. Is it on now? Let's try it. If it works, if it don't, if it, just raise your hand or something. Holler at me, throw something at me, something, all right? And uh, I want us to notice four things from this verse and about uh, the, uh, the idea or the, the word righteousness and how it affects really not only our country but also ourselves. And so I want you to look at a few things uh, with me this morning about the word righteousness. Number one, we're going to look today at righteousness defined. What, we hear about righteousness a lot, we hear about righteousness um, uh, in the Word of God mostly. Uh, we don't hear a lot about it in school, we don't hear a lot about it in, necessarily in our homes. But what does righteousness mean? Righteousness, simply, the best way I can tell you, is right. Okay, so kind of put off the, uh, the, the last portion of that word. Righteousness simply means right. It's, it's really a Bible word. And it has to pertain to God and His righteousness. It refers to holiness and, and perfection and so forth. And simply put, a good way to remember it would be what is right. Okay, And so righteousness is what is right. And can I say that God creates the standard for what is right? Who else is going to establish the definition or the standard for what is right other than our Creator. Right. Amen. Amen. If you think about it, our government and the laws of our land, just common sense thought here, uh, our, our, the laws and, the, and the, the, the governing aspect of America and our society can really be traced back and contributed to many of the principles we find in the Word of God. Let me ask you a question. Is it right or wrong to steal in America? Yeah, it's wrong. I mean, it's, it's common sense. We find that in Exodus chapter number 20, some of the original commandments of God. We call them the Ten Commandments. Don't steal, God says. Isn't that interesting? Oh, that, that came many years prior to the establishment of America in 1776. I mean, America wasn't even thought about at that point. Yet we get a lot of our ideas and the governing laws and so forth uh, of America can be traced back to the, to the Word of God. Isn't it interesting that we try to eliminate the Ten Commandments that we try to live by, and stealing is just one of them that we can relate to, uh, but we try to eliminate a lot of the laws and so forth, that we, the principles that are found in the Word of God, we try to eliminate that from our country and from our schools and from our society, from our minds and our lives. But look where that is taking us. Sometimes we need to look at the track in which we're heading and think about and reevaluate some things for our country. So righteousness simply is right. It pertains to God and His righteousness, and God creates the standard for what is right and wrong. Because, let's face it, let's be honest, one day we will give an account to God. Righteousness is defined by God's person. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 11, verse number 7, the first part of that says, For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. In Psalms chapter 129, verse number 4, the first part of that says simply, The Lord is righteousness. righteous. It is an attribute of God. God is righteous. It is who He is. Just like I would say, your name is so-and-so. Uh, we could say God is righteous. He, there's a lot of attributes of God. He is love. The Bible tells us very clearly. He is holy. And here again we find God is righteous. It is defined by God's person. Now listen carefully. We're going to go somewhere with this. So hang on. The second thing I want you to notice about righteousness defined is righteousness is defined by God's 
actions. Righteousness simply means right. God establishes what is right, not we, not the president, not the Congress. Again, we get many of our laws from what God set forth many years ago. So God sets forth that and we find righteousness is defined in God's person and who he is. And it's also who, what he does. God is righteous in his actions. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 145, verse number 17, the Lord is righteous. There it is again. By the way, you're going to find that all throughout the Word of God. I'm just giving you a couple of examples, the Word of God. But God tells us over and over, He is righteous. And the Bible says the Lord is righteous in all His ways. In all His ways. We find in Jesus' earthly ministry. When Jesus came uh, and began His earthly ministry at 30 years old... And he went about doing good. He went about doing miracles. Uh, the public looked upon him and it was said, He doeth all things well. Jesus, when he walked upon the earth, when he healed people, he never did wrong. The Bible is very clear about that. Jesus was righteous. He never sinned. He never had a wrong thought. Never was disobedient as a teenager to his parents, to his mom, Mary, and to his stepdad, Joseph. Never, and of course, Joseph wasn't his real dad. We understand that. And, and um, uh, but Jesus was righteous in all his ways. God is righteous in all his ways. In Psalms chapter 19, verse number 9, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So not only is God righteous, but he does all things right. Raise your hand if you believe sincerely that God is in control that the direction of our country, the direction of society is not taking God by surprise. God is not in heaven upon his throne saying, what am I going to do now? These crazy people have gone berserk. God knows exactly what is taking place. He knew that would take place. And that's why he has, he has told us in scripture, this is what's going to happen. We see it before our eyes. If we just open up our Bible, we would know exactly what is to come. God's told us, God, this is not taking God by surprise. And God has a plan for the future. If you're a Bible student, you understand that things are going to wrap up. Things are setting up for the Antichrist to come on the scene. In the tribulation period, the wrath of God upon society. You see, God has, because of his righteousness, he has to judge. And because uh, his judgment will take place in the great and the tribulation period... And yet we'll be gone. I'm thankful for the rapture of the church. And that's, the message is not it's centered upon that. But I'm thankful that when God judges America and the world because of its ungodliness, we'll be gone, we'll be with the Lord, and then God will set up his kingdom. We're thankful for that. But God is righteous in all his ways. In other words, God has never made a mistake. He said, well, Pastor, what about this situation in my life? God has never made a mistake. Let me remind you, the Bible says the Lord is righteous in all. There's that word again. What does all mean in the Greek and the Hebrew? All. God is righteous in all his ways. Entire, he's perfect. In everything that he's allowed in your life. Let me ask you a question. Come here for a second. What about Job? And he allowed Satan to take everything from him except his wife and even took his own health. Was God righteous then? Did God say, I'm going to stop being who I am for this season of Job's life? No, God was righteous in all his ways. Raise your hand if you're thankful that God allowed that for a good example that we have of a man named Job in the Bible. God is righteous in all his ways. God has a plan. We, don't, can't, we cannot see it. The Bible tells us very specifically his thoughts are, are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. And we cannot comprehend that. We can't understand that. But we can trust a righteous God who will always do what is right. Notice the next thing. Not only do we see righteousness defined, but I want you to know, secondly, righteousness dismissed. You say, what in the world does that mean? You just talked about righteousness and God is righteous and all of that. Well, what does that mean? We're talking about righteousness is dealing with man's righteousness in light of God's righteousness. And you'll see what I'm talking about in just a moment. Man's righteousness has been, I want you to know, has been described and it's also been decreed. So you've got God's righteousness defined. God is righteous. He's righteous in all his ways. But then... What about our righteousness? 
Well, God said, this is what I think about your righteousness. And he told us in Isaiah chapter 64, verse number 6. Listen carefully. This is what God says about our righteousness. But we, you can put yourself there by way of application, but we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness, wait a minute. Okay, my ears are perked up here. My righteousness, because the, 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 the normal, regular person in America today and really in the world today thinks they're right. They're okay. I, I ha- this, 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 we have this mindset that me and God have things worked out. That, that's so disrespectful. We're putting ourselves on God's level somehow. And I just don't, this, this grades against my spirit because we're not on God's level. Let's just be honest. He says here, Isaiah 64, verse 6, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. One of the preachers that was with us not too long ago gave reference to this and made a very good application of this. I can't remember who it was, but uh, filthy rags is not a, a necessarily an only rag like some of you guys have in your garage. Filthy rags, in, in that Bible day, there was a disease called leprosy, and there's still in some third world countries today the uh, diseases of leprosy, and it's a really uh, horrible disease. And these filthy rags gave reference to somebody who was having a, had the disease called leprosy and they would have pus and uh, body fluids that would ooze out of their body different portions of that disease and how it would affect their lives and they would take that rag and they would wipe themselves it was a filthy rag and God said that is what I'm describing your righteousness it's filthy rags and we, we, we need to come to grips with that we need to understand that. It is not a, it's not necessarily to, to, to put us down, but God says, I just want to just to be honest and transparent because your righteousness is described as filthy rights, my righteousness. Now, man's righteousness has not only been described, but man's righteousness in Romans chapter 3, verse number 10 has been decreed. God says very clearly, as it is written, the Bible says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Oh, there might be some good people out there. I'm looking at a whole congregation of wonderful, wonderful, good people. But let's just be honest, we do not do right all the time. Have you ever made a mistake? Somebody said no. God bless you. Okay. (laughs) Sign my Bible after church. You know, Everybody makes mistakes, some small, some big. You ever been disobedient to your parents? One time. Don't tell me that you always obedient. Some of you got something, you've, you, 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 uh, you grew up and you never told anybody, but you stole that cookie. You never told your parents, and now you, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not trying to guilt you or nothing. I'm just saying, <laughs> just use the example. We've all done wrong Things. There's some good people out there. They do some right things. Oh, they help the lady across the street. They park behind somebody and help them with a flat tire on the interstate. They buy somebody's meal and they do this and they do all. Oh, there's so many things that they give to charity and, the, and they, 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 in church and serving in ministry. We do some right things. But in reality, compared to God, we're not righteous. Because if you've done one thing wrong, and let's just be honest, let's go back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The first sin for man was what? Disobeying God. So let's go back all the way to our childhood. Even at one time we disobeyed our parents. We did something we knew we should not do. Then that keeps us from being righteous. You're no longer righteous because you sinned one time. Is everybody... Is that, so, and, and, and uh, that's just a way to understand what God has already said. There is none righteous, no, not one. So God has described our righteousness as filthy rags. And God has very clearly said there's none righteous, no, not one. We're going somewhere. Can I see there is an attempt to be righteous? The Bible talks about the people in that day and the Jewish people in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 3. The Bible says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. There was people in Jesus' day and the Apostle Paul's day 
and they were going about to establish their own righteousness. They were going about, they were very religious. They had never trusted in Jesus as their personal Savior, but they were doing right things. They were even quoting scripture. They would put things on their uh, little like headbands and bracelets upon their wrist and upon their forehead to say to everybody else, hey, I memorize scripture and I hide this in my, I have this where I'll see it all the time and I have this in my mind and they'll fast and they would pray and they would do right things and they would establish their own righteousness, if you will. And they were ignoring the righteousness of God. Do you see that in America today? I see it very clearly. People going about and saying, I don't care what God says. This is what I believe to be right in mine own eyes. We're going back to the time period of the book of Judges. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that's why they constantly had issues with other nations coming in and taking them and oppressing them because every person was doing what was right in their own eyes instead of looking up to God and saying, Lord, you're the only one righteous, tell us what to do. But we are living in a country, in a society where we're establishing and trying to, attempting to establish our own righteousness. But there needs to be now more than ever an admittance of our unrighteousness. And by the way, that's the only way to go to heaven. No one will go to heaven thinking I'm okay. No one will ever go to heaven having this mindset that I, me and God have things worked out. No, sir. The Bible says very clearly in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Well, being saved is how you get to heaven. You don't be saved from, we're not saved from a car accident or cancer situation. We're saved from our sins which take us to a place called hell, which keep us from going to a perfect place called heaven. And the Bible teaches us that the way to be saved is to confess. Confess what? Well, confess that Jesus died for me and realize that the reason he died is because I am not righteous, I'm not perfect, but he was and he took my sins upon him. And I'm to confess that. I'm to say, Lord, I realize I'm not good enough to go to heaven. I can't do enough good works to go to heaven. The Bible says in Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It is not by my own righteousness, but what Jesus has done for me and shedding his blood for my sins and the only way to go to heaven is to confess and say Lord I know I'm not righteous but you are and I thank you for dying for my sins and I want you to save me and take me to heaven when I die so God says I am righteous that's the definition God is righteous in his person and who he is God is righteous in his actions and God uh, is, is righteous in everything he does. And then God says, your righteousness, your attempted righteousness is like filthy rags. There's none righteous, no, not one. You have to realize that you are not in order to go to heaven. Now I want you to notice the third thing quickly this morning. And that is righteousness delivered. Righteousness delivered. We're going somewhere. Is everybody still on the train? The bus, the ship, whatever you want to call it. Righteousness delivered. Some of you, you still not smile today. And uh, maybe one day, okay? And um, all right, number three, righteousness delivered. It won't kill you to smile. I assure you of that, okay? Somebody said there's less, there's, you take, it takes more, and I'm joking but about your laughing and smiling and all that. But some, really, somebody said it takes more muscles in your face to frown than it does smile. Some of you are going to think about that the rest of the service. And uh, so, righteousness delivered. God delivers invaluable and precious things to you and I. Would you agree with that? I'm thankful that God doesn't charge. Everybody else charges arm and a leg for everything. Everything. So expensive. God says, I don't charge you for anything. There's so many things that God has delivered to you and I. I thought about God's love. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us. 
I'm thankful God has delivered his love for us. He said in his word, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. If you, if you don't hear anything else I say, I, wanna, I want you to remember, God loves you. He's told you in his word and he showed you on the cross. God loves you. He's delivered that to you and I. God has delivered his son to you and I. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. I'm thankful that God delivered his son for you and I. I'm thankful that God delivers grace to you and I. Grace to be saved. Grace to keep on going. You ever had a hard time in Christian life living for Jesus and you just didn't understand? You thought, man, I'm going through difficulty after difficulty. I'm going through storm after storm. But yet God, as you look to him, God continues to give you grace. And then 20 years goes by in your Christian life and you look back and you say, how did I go through that? And the only way that you can say, the only way that I got through that storm, that hardship, Job, how did you go through that season of your life? And perhaps Job would say, God's grace. God gave me grace. God delivers his love. God delivers peace. God delivers so many things to us. But this is what I want us to zero in on this morning. And that is God delivers righteousness to you and I. I want you to give me your very, undiv- very clear uh, attention right now for just a moment. Listen to Romans chapter 5, verse number 19. The Bible says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Guess who that was? Adam. One man's disobedience. The Bible teaches us that because of one man's sin, everybody's sinners now. In other words, when Adam had his children, they inherited that sin nature that Adam started with, with disobedience. That's why me and you, nobody had to teach us in elementary school how to be a sinner. <laughs> we already knew. I have never set my children down at the dinner table and said, children, I want to teach you something about life, and that is one-on-one. This is how you sin. They know. They're born sinners just like we're all born sinners. We know how to sin. And that came from Adam. The Bible says, Romans 5, 19, For us by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one. Now, who's that? The obedience to the death of the cross. Jesus said, I will go. I love Jody. I love Mike. I love Lewis. I love Steve. I'll go. I'll be obedient to the death of the cross. I will give my life in place of theirs. I will die for them. For the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It's kind of like this. When you trust Christ as your Savior because you realize you're not righteous and God is, and one day God is going to hold you accountable because of your unrighteousness, but you trust Christ as your Savior. You say, I don't want to spend eternity in a place called hell. I want to go to heaven. So you accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And, and, and you, you uh, trust Christ as your personal Savior. And uh, so now, God doesn't look at you from heaven and say, they're unrighteous, my wrath is upon them, they've got to be punished because of their sinner, and the only punishment is, is hell. I've told them that, and they still do not choose to trust me. You've got the wrath of God abiding upon you as a sinner. But the very moment, the very instant that you trust Christ as your personal Savior, God then looks at you and says, Jesus. He sees the blood that Jesus shed for you. He sees righteousness. And that's what that verse and many others pertain to. When God looks at us, God does not see our sin as a saved individual. God does not see the wrath, his wrath upon us and judgment upon us. But God, all he sees is Jesus because Jesus took your place. And when you accepted Jesus Christ, God only sees righteousness. We're covered, you see, by the blood of Christ. And I'm thankful for that this morning. Now, number four and lastly, and I'm done. Righteousness in our deeds. So we've got righteousness is defined, righteousness dismissed, righteousness delivered, but then righteousness in our deeds. So if you and I have been saved, we have been delivered, okay, we have been delivered righteousness at salvation. God not, not only uh, n- n- no longer sees us as a sinner, but now sees us uh, the righteousness of God upon us. 
And then I want you to notice how that we should desire righteousness as being saved. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins, listen, here it is, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. So let's review for just a moment. I know we just did, but let's do it again. Righteousness is divine. God is righteous. He defines that and who he is and all that he does. Righteousness is dismissed. God says, although you may try to establish your own righteousness, God says, as your creator, I'm telling you, there's none righteous, no, not one. Our righteousness is filthy rags. God dismisses our unrighteousness, but God says, I will do something for you. I will deliver righteousness to you on the fact that you trust my son as your personal savior. And then we are to live the rest of our lives doing good deeds of righteousness. Because I am saved, I should desire to live a life of righteousness that pleases my God. The life of Christ is a motive for our righteous deeds. Would you agree with that? We said just a few moments ago that Jesus was righteous in everything that he did. And his life is giving his ministry and everything that he said, not everything, but all the things that God wanted us to know about him and his life has been recorded in this book right here. And so when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, we are reminded of the, and really all throughout the New Testament, we're to, we are reminded of the life and ministry of Christ. And I, as a saved person, because I have delivered righteousness into my life, now I should try to live a life of righteousness and I have the life of Christ as the ultimate example. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. The life of Christ is a motive for my righteous deeds. And then the death of Christ is a motive for my righteous deeds. I can't get over the fact that Jesus loved me so much that he died for me. And now God has imputed righteousness upon those who believed upon him. And now that gives me a desire because of what Jesus has done for me to live for him. And God says one thing that you can do for me is live righteously. Do we fail? Yes. But I thank God that I can have my sins forgiven even though I'm a saved person. And I can continue on living and pleasing the Lord. And then one other thing that gives me and helps me with that desire to live righteousness, and that is the words of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and get this, for instruction in righteousness. God says, Here's your instruction to live godly in this present world. And here's the last point, the last thought of this point number four. Our righteous actions will make a difference. Do you still have your Bibles open to Proverbs? Look at Proverbs chapter 14. I got a, a three or four grunts, so I, I assume that you're still with me. Proverbs chapter 34, <laughs> chapter 14. I'm sorry. I really don't try to do that. Chapter 14 and verse number 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So I think you'll agree with me when I say righteousness makes a difference. Because God just told us righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So you say, Pastor, I'm on board with you. I really want our country to, to, to turn to righteousness. But you know where it starts? It starts right here. Come here for a minute. I cannot expect, if our president is not saved, I don't know his soul's heart. I don't know anybody's heart except mine. I can only tell by the fruit of other people. But I cannot tell whether our president is saved. But if he's not saved, then I cannot expect him to do righteous deeds or to lead our country in a righteous direction. If our mayor or governor, anybody else, if they are not saved, then they do not have the righteousness of God imputed upon them. So I cannot expect them 
to have a desire to do what's right according to God and His Word. That's why God tells us to pray. No doubt, God tells us to pray for those in leadership positions. Not that they fall and break their neck, but they would perhaps trust Christ as their Savior. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Righteousness, sir, starts with you, Dad. Mom, righteousness starts with you. Teenager, righteousness starts. You say, well, nobody else is. Well, let's, this thing is between me and God. You and God. And if God has saved you, may God help us to have that desire in our heart. Maybe nobody else in my neighborhood is going to live righteously. Maybe no, And listen, I'm not being cocky and I'm not saying I am righteous. Uh, no, no, none of us. We fail, God, we fail God every day with wrong thoughts and things and, and so forth. We fail every day. Thank God for 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The just man falleth seven times, yet riseth up again. You keep on going. But there's this inner burning desire in every saved person's heart should be to say, Lord, I want to start my day and I want to do my best to live righteously for you amongst an ungodly nation. Because I love my country and I want to see it exalted. And the only way that it will be exalted is through righteousness. And it starts with me. I cannot force you to live righteously and godly and you can't force your family and you can't force your neighbor. You can't force your government leaders to live righteously. But you know what you can? You can live righteously and allow them to see Christ in you. And you can allow them to see a difference in your speech, in your spirit, and how you conduct yourselves against bitterness and advers adversity and so many other things. I don't know about you, but I want to live righteously. Oh, I, you say, Pastor, you're probably perfect. Well, yeah, many people would say that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you want to know the truth, ask my wife after church. I fail every day, oh my soul. But I thank God for his forgiveness. And I thank God that there is a burning desire in my heart to please the Lord every day. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this evening, this morning. With heads bowed and eyes are closed, we've learned today in the quietness of this moment during the invitation time to respond to what we've heard. God always does right. Sometimes we get bitter at God. Sometimes we want to say, God, why did you do this? Why did you allow this? Oh, that's, that should never be the case. God always does what's right. And our righteousness, our righteousness has been dismissed by God, but thank God he's delivered righteousness to us through Jesus Christ. And there should be a desire on a daily basis to live righteousness, righteously based upon that. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I realize that I'm not saved. I realize that if I died today, I know in my heart I'm not going to be with the Lord because I've never taken care of that. I've never called upon the Lord, confessed my sin. I've never done that. Would you raise your hand? I would love to pray for you this morning. Would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, I need to trust Christ. I know I need to do that. I've never done it. I really would like for you to pray for me. Anybody like that this morning? I wonder if you're here this morning. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or come or anything like that, but I, I do want to encourage you. The altar's open to respond to what we've heard. And perhaps you're here and the Holy Spirit of God has worked in your heart in some way or the other for your country, for your home, for your individual life. And you realize that because of your life, you, you need to get some sin out of that to, in order to live pleasing to the Lord, whatever it may be. I want to encourage you to come this morning. As the musicians begin playing, Brother Holly's going to sing this song. And let's all stand together all over the building with heads bowed and eyes are closed. As we sing... Brother Holly leads us. Would you come with heads bowed and eyes are closed? So Would you come? How about it, sir? How about it, Lord, help me to live righteously. Lord, thank you for calling me for me you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Why? Watching for you and for me. Some of come. How about it, sir? How about it, man? Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly tend. Is calling, calling, oh sinner, 
We have several things going on, and we want to remind you of these events coming up this summer. It'll be just another moment, uh, maybe about, I don't know, a minute, and a minute and a half, and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for joining us this morning here at Temple for our morning worship service. If you are visiting with us today, we trust the service has been a blessing to you and hope that you are able to be with us again very soon. We would like to remind you of a few upcoming events during the summer season. The next Empty Nesters Fellowship will be on Saturday, July 22nd at 6 p.m. If you are between the ages of 50 and 65, make plans now to join us for a great time of fellowship at the Monte de Rey Restaurant in Clemens. If you plan to be a part, please see the sign-up sheet today located in the entryway. For any questions, please see Jeff or Nancy Cox. Our first Sizzlin' Summer Sunday night of 2023 will be immediately following our service this evening. Join us for a free and delicious meal as well as fellowship with our church family. Weather permitting, we will be outside in the courtyard area, so don't forget your folding chairs. The Ladies Missionary Prayer Fellowship Ministry of our church is having a summer craft and bake sale today. Drop by the Activity Center after this morning service only for a delicious treat or beautiful craft. Join us in prayer this week for our teens as they head out to Powell, Tennessee for an exciting week of Youth Congress. We are looking forward to God's many blessings from this special week. Our annual men's boarding clay tournament is coming up on Saturday, July 29th. Make plans now to join us for this great time of fun and fellowship with the men of our church. If you would like to be a part, please see the sign-up sheet as well as other information located in the entryway. Thank you.
thank you once again for joining us this morning. We would like to invite each family to be back with us again this evening at 6 o'clock p.m. for special singing as well as another helpful message from God's Word that will strengthen us spiritually. All right, let's stand once again. We're going to be dismissed. I want to thank you so much for being here on this July 4th weekend. Don't miss tonight, 5 o'clock uh, ministry, music ministry meeting, 6 o'clock service. And we'll be talking about from the Gospel of Mark tonight, children, the importance of children, and uh, what God says about that in His Word. And I want to encourage you to be here, be faithful for that. And then our sizzling summer Sunday night, you don't want to miss that, all right? And uh, sign-up sheets, there's several there in the entryway. Take a moment to find those uh, men's sporting clay, empty nesters or two I know of that are out there, perhaps more. Keep all these announcements in mind. I want to encourage you to turn around and to smile, shake a hand, thank someone beside you for being here today. God bless you. See you in just a little bit. Thank you.